So welcome to this virtual edition of the FEMSI 2020 conference, Biting into Ocean Education. My name is Dana Henderson and I am your new president of FEMSI. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. So for those of you that don't know, we are barely new to Zoom. After this week though, we've kind of gotten it down. Um, but if you have any technical issues or we have any technical issues, just please be patient with us. Um, I'll be moderating, so if you need to, um, Put anything in the chat or anything, please do so. Sorry, let me just admit these people. <laughs> so the presentation will be about 40 to 45 minutes with time for questions at the end for a total of about an hour. So please feel free to type in any questions in the chat box on the screen throughout the presentation and we'll give time at the end and I'll go over and read those questions. Um, if you guys wanna stick around after after the presentation, I have a few closing remarks for us, and then we're gonna have a little virtual happy hour after that. So also guys, please note um, that this is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. So I am pleased to introduce our presenters for this session. Janine Windsor is a Naples native who was, has worked at Rookery Bay Research Reserve for over five years. She coordinates the reserve's outreach program and the seventh grade survivors field trip program. Dita O'Boyle is a transplant from Minnesota who has been in Southwest, Southwest Florida for eight years. At the reserve, she coordinates elementary school trips focusing on estuary explorers trips. Both are instructors for Florida Master Naturalists and love sharing their passion for estuaries with students and the public. So welcome Janine and Dita. Um, you guys are co-hosts, so whenever you guys are ready, go ahead and, and share your screen. And um, if everyone will make sure that you're muted throughout the presentation and use that chat box for questions. So take it away, guys. Okay, can everybody see? Am I sharing properly? Yes, looks good. Yep, I'll, I'll rely on Dana for my answer. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to the board, um, to all the members, to everybody who um, made this happen virtually. Um, we're obviously the coolest group of nerds in the state, maybe even the world, um, I think. So I'm just really excited that we could still present because this is a really cool activity that um, Dita and I are both super excited to share with you guys. Um, I do want to mention that Dita is going to uh, drop in a link in the chat box. Um, Dita, are you good to go with that? I'm resubmitting it for the new arrivals. <laughs> awesome. So there's a link in the chat box that you could click on. This is an interactive uh, portion, an interactive presentation. Um, so you can click on that and it's going to give you access to some of the worksheets um, that we'll be showing you as well as materials that students are, are able to use um, when we do this activity, which we dubbed Sharks by Salinity. Um, we also want to ask that uh, maybe you take out a piece of scrap paper and have a pencil or pen um, because this is interactive. We're going to be um, giving you some data to record. So if you have the resources to print those worksheets, you can do that, or you can just use a scrap paper and just look at the, um, the shareable uh, link that Dia provided. Um, the flow for this virtual program is going to be um, a brief introduction to Rookery Bay. Um, we're going to highlight some of the background information for our juvenile shark monitoring efforts, which um, will include like some baseline data. Um, it's information that helped us to develop sharks by salinity. And then we'll do a mock run with the activity as, um, and we'll use all of you as our students. Um, and we'll add in all the bloopers that occur when we have these um, activities with students, you know, the mishaps, things that, um, questions that arise. Uh, yeah, um, so that's kind of how the flow is going to go. Um, hopefully, many of you are already familiar with Rookery Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, but just a little bit, um, up in the left-hand corner of the screen, the top left, that's actually our state partner, uh, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. They're our uh, main funding source. Um, and then in the lower right-hand corner, you should maybe notice the NOAA logo. Um, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, we also receive funding from them. Um, and um, another fun name for that is the National Organization of Advancement of Acronyms. Um, 
that's a funny joke my husband likes to say because we have so many acronyms in our line of work. Um, but going a, a little bit more into that national network that Rookery Bay is a part of, um, you know, essentially this is uh, 29 uh, coastal sites that we are part of a, a network, um, 30, soon to be 30. Um, then they're designated to protect and study estuaries. Um, so the reserves represent a partnership between NOAA and coastal states. Um, NOAA provides funding and national guidance, and then each state has that uh, lead agency and like local partners um, that they utilize. So in Florida, as you can see, we're really lucky. We have three um, NERS. So um, we are down here at Rookery Bay, and then we've got up on the East Coast there, just north of St. Augustine, Guanatalamato, Matanzas um, Research Reserve. And then we've got, where did my mouse go? Uh, here in the Panhandle, we've got Apalachicola. So really cool uh, to be able to network closely with two other reserves right in our own state. And now we're zoomed into uh, Rookery Bay. So here is just a look at our boundaries. Um, they're highlighted in yellow. And we run from the north end here, which is just, I'm gonna get my, actually I'll get my, uh, my pointer, my laser. Um, so we run from the north end, which is, sorry, all these things keep popping up while I'm trying to do this. Um, the north end, which is like just uh, south of Naples, it's like the downtown area, um, and then along the coast around Marco Island, this large island here, and then south um, and jutting out eastward into the 10,000 islands. Uh, this is our 110,000 acres, um, which represents about 40% of Collier County's coastline. And um, if you're not familiar with what Collier County looks like, as far as like how big it is, we are, we're huge. We're the second largest county in the state. Um, we're like almost twice the size of Rhode Island, you know, it's a really large county. So 40% of the coastline is kind of, it's a big deal. And um, we're mostly submerged aquatic habitat, uh, but we do have some significant um, areas of uplands. And uh, Dita is going to introduce you to um, one of our monitoring programs that actually has to do with this specific area of monitoring, or specific uplands area, sorry. Um, that we'll zoom into on the next slide. And um, we all know that what happens uh, in the uplands, you know, activities there affect what happens downstream. So we'll jump right into that. Cool, so that area that Janine was pointing to is now called Picayune Strand. And this is actually a pretty interesting area. So now it's a state forest. But back in the 1960s, the picture on the left is um, that's the general overview zoomed in on that part. You can't really see my hands. Take, oh, <laughs> think about that. I talk with my hands. Shoot. <laughs> um, but so Picayune Strand was slated to be a development. So state parks normally don't have that gridlock looking system. But back in the late 1960s, it was going to be one of the largest housing uh, developments in the country, actually. And they'd fly people out in planes, drop bags of flowers, say, look, it's not a marsh, we promise. It's not a swamp. And of course it was. So the company went bankrupt, but not until after they built all those lovely canals and roads. And um, this has actually become a really big restoration project. It's the largest project for the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Act. So they're actually trying to reset the sheet flow because all those lovely large canals that you can see on the picture on the right, they're really large and they're drastically changing the water flow for the watersheds um, further downstream. So currently this restoration project, what they're doing is they are filling in those canals with rubble and they're making them into little pools. So you have a lot of nice feeding areas for birds, more crayfish, breeding areas for frogs, and they're working from east to west. So back on the left-hand side, the blue lines on the map are the canals that are already been filled. And this has been going on for maybe around 20 years. So this is a long-term project because, you know, things go slowly sometimes. 
And what our fisheries biologist is actually doing is he's um, looking at how successful this restoration project is. So in particular, he is looking at, we'll see if I got the spotlight figured out, the bay is here, <laughs> here, and here. So not quite a spotlight, but you know, drawing works the same. <laughs> and so these three bays have all been affected different ways by this canal system. So this middle one that's directly connected to the canal is Faca Union Bay. And this bay gets a really large amount of extra fresh water, especially in the wet season. And when that water does get into the system, it actually comes late. So the timing for that bay is completely off. The bay um, to the left, this is Pumpkin Bay. And that bay actually doesn't get enough fresh water, so it stays at higher salinities for a longer period of time. So it still does go through that daily cycling. It's just, um, it doesn't change as much as it maybe would naturally. And like any good research project, you really have to have the control. So the bay at the bottom, oh, come on, go away. Oh, never mind. <laughs> this one right here is Fakahatchee Bay, and that is considered our most natural system. So that's our control and our baseline data to see if the restoration project is working. So hopefully those two uh, more western bays are going to show fish populations, including sharks, uh, more similar to the Fakahatchee Bay as this restoration project occurs. Again, it's been going on for 20 years, so we're still kind of in our pre or during restoration process at the moment. All right, let's see if I can switch this over. Oh, I can without it. Ah, yep, that's what they do. I got my pointer though now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so looking a little bit more into the changes in water quality and why that is a big issue. Oh, goodness. I'm not kidding about clicking too fast. So there's a lot of different parameters. Um, since we are a national uh, estuarine research reserve, we have a water quality program. And so we collect different parameters every five minutes at a few, um, five different stations actually. And a big one that we're going to be focusing on is salinity because that salinity pr um, parameters, they are expected to change daily. We have our lovely tidal cycles. We have our seasonal cycles. So you want to expect some variety. But in this graph on the y-axis, this is going to be our salinity in parts per thousand. And then your x-axis is your years. So this is a very long period of time showing how the salinity changes. I want you really just to focus on the Faca Union Bay and Fakahatchee Bay. And you can see that that orange yellow line gets much lower more often than the, either of the other two bays. And so in Faca Union in the wet season, sometimes it can actually go from freshwater up to about 15 parts per thousand in about 20 minutes. So that is a pretty stressful environment for animals, even if they're adaptive to changes in salinity. Now, when you're, so with our shark species in the wet season, which species we see, there's a bunch of different species we see. Um, we see eight commonly in our sampling year. That doesn't mean there's only eight sharks in the reserve's boundaries, but those are the ones we get in those three bays. And in the wet season, which species we see is mainly affected by that salinity range. So we have our bull shark um, on your y-axis is the percentage of species caught total, then each um, row is a different species, and then the bottom is that salinity range again. And that bull shark, you can see, we see pretty much every salinity because they're that really well adapted shark species versus the other ones maybe have a little bit more narrower range. So that's making them a really, really good study animal for this restoration project. And when you look just at the wet season numbers, it's pretty big difference. So we have the bull shark is the red bar, the black tip is gonna be the black bar, which you really only see in Fakahatchee. We have our lemon shark and then the bonnet head. And when you look at the Fak Union versus Fakahatchee, there is a very, very distinct <laughs> difference in number of sharks. And also that diversity has gone way down. So we wanted to take all this fun scientific data and make it fun for students. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, Dita and I just, uh, do I still have, do you have control? I gotta give it back to you, sorry. Okay. Ta-da. Um, so yeah, Dita and I basically, um, well, our whole team, you know, we, we love uh, translating the actual research and monitoring of our staff over into our education department. Um, so we really wanted to come up with a way to interpret all of the fun data you just saw um, for our, our education programs. And um, we mentioned, I think in the blurb, the description, you know, this has an overarching science to management theme, um, especially with the monitoring effort. But uh, that doesn't sound exciting to kids. You can't do, do an activity called science to management with sharks. It, they won't understand. Um, so uh, sharks by salinity is a lot more uh, exciting. Um, sharks are super cool. Um, and they end up making the connection in their results uh, of this activity. So it's really cool. They learn the science about sharks. Um, they learn, you know, uh, these they learn the science of sharks. They understand that um, if we know this stuff, then we can tell decision makers about, um, especially if it's something happening somewhere totally far away, like for instance, with the Picayune, um, you know, and they can, they can relate that information to those people who are making decisions to management. So they walk away, you know, with critical thinking skills. They're using um, observation. We get into anatomy, just the idea that fish, which they learn that sharks are fish, um, you know, can tell us what's happening on land. That's kind of a, like a really wild statement. Um, and uh, here's some of our groups that we've um, done this Sharks by Salinity Lab with. We've got um, over here on the left is the homeschool group. You can see the preserved specimen on the table, all their fun worksheets. Um, the lower right hand corner is a girls um, day, like a science and action day that we've joined before. And then the picture up on the right, um, there's actually a, it's a preserved specimen, a frozen specimen that this um, student's handling. And um, that's from our current uh, CCPS, our Collier County Public School Program survivors that I teach, um, where we actually have sharks by salinity as one of our rotations. Uh, so the students arrive and they break up into groups and a group of 10 to 15 will come and they will do this lab that we're about to show you. And another cool thing I'll just say about our connection with local public schools um, is that they will pay for busing and for materials. And in turn, the teacher comes onto the field trip and actually helps lead. So it's like a really cool participation. And this is the lab that the teachers learn about and help lead, uh, which is, makes it really special. Um, we also have volunteers that help uh, help us in these labs too. So shout out to some of the volunteers uh, that I saw already in this presentation. Um, so aside from the science to management aspect, these are other takeaways that we're driving through this activity. You know, we want them to understand the dependency uh, on estuaries. They're so important. Sharks, these juvenile sharks, um, that's what we're working with. You know, they depend on this estuary. Estuary, it's a nursery um, for many fish many species. Uh, we want them to understand that not uh, that they all have different tolerances um, and we focus on salinity um, and they can be affected with drastic changes um, in salinity and that most of these fish, these sharks, they, they can't tolerate real low salinity. So um, those are just some great takeaways that uh, you know we try to provide through this activity. All right, so now is when you're going to you will use your um, paper, uh, uh, well soon, get your paper ready, get your paper and pencil ready. Um, if you have clicked on the link that Dita provided, um, I don't know if it's buried somewhere by now. I just resent it. Awesome, so Dita resent the link again. Uh, this has, um, these two images will appear first uh, if you've clicked on that link and then there's a few more that we'll get into in a few slides, but um, so the students are in the lab and they're broken up into even smaller groups and they're at stations. So on the left hand side here, um, this is a worksheet that they'll use as a group to collect information about a shark specimen. So um, we'll have anywhere from three to five specimen out as a station. And so they're collecting common name, scientific name, uh, fun fact, so hard to choose which one. Um, and then the oh so important salinity range. And then on the right hand side, looks a little more complicated, but um, drawing your eyes to the two tables at the bottom, the one on the left, 
smaller table, that's where they will, um, when they're at the salinity station, uh, they are gonna collect their dry season salinity for the three bays that Dita mentioned, and they'll collect the wet season salinity. And then um, the table on the, the lower right, um, if we have time, we'll fill it in all together at the end when we're looking at our results. Uh, but otherwise they will go um, back in the classroom and uh, they'll finish that up. This really works best with like two to three students per station. So you can kind of choose how many specimens you have based on how many students you're gonna get. All right, so now we got to look at our water quality station. Um, this is a modified version of, uh, so, um, or our salinity station, water quality, same thing, right? Uh, this is where they start using, uh, this is where we will start using our scrap paper because I'm gonna give you some data about the base to write down. So have that ready. Um, this station includes a map. Um, it could be this map, it could be one similar, but basically we want them to reference the Picayune strand, the site, see it, see the disturbed watershed, and then it'll have the three bays labeled and they'll be color coded to the um, samples that you see there on the, um, on the table. So um, we have a one dry season sample, you'll notice, and three wet season samples. Um, basically, in the dry season, um, the December through May, the average salinity, which is, this is going to be a loose average that we give the students, it's a true data, it's a true data set, but um, it's loose, and it, there's not a lot of, there's not drastic change between each bay in the dry season. So we just give them one to write down for all three. So if you are following along, I would like you to record um, the average salinity for our dry season is 35 parts per thousand. And that's gonna be for all three bays. So Pumpkin Bay, 35 parts per thousand. Faca Union Bay, 35 parts per thousand. Fakahatchee Bay, 35 parts per thousand. And you'll see it has its own sample jar um, that we've you know, made a solution. Um, it has its own pipette. And then we'll typically have two or three refractometers um, so that uh, multiple students can do it at once, or each student at least has a chance to work with the equipment. Um, then we've got our wet season. So these are the individual samples um, for Pumpkin Bay, the wet season, which would be June through November. We've got an average salinity of 25 parts per thousand. A swallowtail kite just flew right around me. That was amazing. Um, so, sorry. Um, so that was 25, if you're recording for the wet season in Pumpkin Bay, 25 parts per thousand. In FACA Union Bay, five parts per thousand for the average wet season. And then Fakahachi is 15 parts per thousand for the average salinity. So um, we do have a lot of, uh, we, we've been calling them bloopers at this station um, and the cool thing is they always create an opportunity for us to learn, for the students to learn, and then we can all understand errors in our data. So common things that happen here are uh, they mix their pipettes up and, um, and they contaminate their sample uh, or contaminate their pipette. You know, they didn't uh, flush it all the way. So just error in using your equipment. Um, the refractometer, that can be tricky. Uh, some schools, we do get a chance to go in ahead of time and uh, practice with these tools before they come to the, the site, but not it doesn't always end up being that way. So if you're using one for the first time, did they read the, the right side or the left side? Are they taking down the correct units, um, the correct measurement? Um, another common thing that happens um, is I forgot to calibrate the refractometer. So it could be uh, an error on my part. Um, and then the other thing that happens is they're also busy and intrigued with the refractometer or like playing with pipettes that no one's recording data and they're all just saying numbers out loud and then they don't have anything to share at the end. So um, I'm sure as educators, you can all understand these things, uh, but those are, those are typical things that happen at our salinity station. Okay, so hopefully you have uh, that uh, data recorded somewhere. If you were able to print off your worksheet or just on your scrap paper. Um, so now we're at like a, we're at a shark station, imagine, if you will. Um, and these are the items that a student would have in front of them. Um, we included in the link the lower two uh, pages, if you will. Imagine these are, this is four pages on one slide. So the lower two were included in the link, the top two were not. 
um, because essentially you arrive at the station and you have a uh, specimen to look at. So this would be species one or shark one, specimen one. Um, and this is a, a model of a shark, um, a 3D model, but we have, um, as you saw in previous pictures, preserved specimen. We use a variety of um, artistic uh, depictions, photos, and it's good to have all that variety because with a preserved specimen, whether it's frozen or you know in a jar, it loses coloration. Um, some of them are bent in odd shapes. You can't see all the, the fins you know, properly. So there can be like a distortion. Um, and it just encourages the students to use multi like multiple medias, um, which is really great because they have to talk through it more. They have to really just be engaged with the anatomy. So um, going clockwise, we went from our model to the right. We're looking at the anatomy. Um, Dita's gonna get more into this, uh, how important it becomes. We didn't include this for all of you because we felt everybody would be comfortable with anatomy terms as we go through the activity. Um, but they use that, uh, they depend on it, uh, quite honestly. And then um, the lower right, we've got our information sheet on this particular specimen. So it includes all, that, uh, all the cool fun facts, the salinity range that they have to record, the um, scientific name, and then um, the dichotomous key, the lower left, uh, that is how they're collecting their actual common name and how they're IDing uh, their shark. So they have to work through this sheet. Um, now, before we uh, get started with these labs, we have the students actually go through the dichotomous key together because we want to work out the kinks. We want to get the majority of questions, you know, answered as if they're confused about how to use it. Not all students um, have done dichotomous keys before. Um, so it just depends on the group. Um, but yeah, we have a basically a similar discussion that we've already had, but like on a, you know, a diluted level as far as all the background information for the Picayune, the, the shark monitoring program, you know, what sharks are and how important they are. We have all of that as a group conversation before actually breaking up and starting on the labs. And uh, with that, I'll let Dita walk us through this awesome uh, dichotomous key. So this key is actually based off of FWC's, their guide for how to identify sharks that they give their fisheries biologists. So we did try to um, pull a lot of the information off that. Of course, we're not going to be asking seventh graders to look for sea lines on different sharks, so it is simplified a little bit. Um, and again, we wanted them to use older resources. So the goal of this key is where they're going to get their common name, and then the fact sheet has their scientific name on it. So the very first question, we're going to walk through it like we were taking a shark spice salinity lab, is the body flat with gills on the underside? And we do get some kids stuck on this, even if we just have sharks in the room because they're not quite sure what is considered a flat body. Um, so that's always kind of interesting. And we have no. So then you go down to your single dorsal fin. Um, we do not have any access to six gill sharks, even though that'd be super cool. Your spiny dorsal fin, is it absent or not? Um, that's really making the kids start to think about what that dorsal fin is and, oh, it's not just a triangle on the back. They have to look for all those little small characteristics that they maybe don't think about. Are the dorsal sized, are the dorsal fins equal sized? So that can give you two different options. Is the head flattened? And now this is where a lot of kids will look at their shark at their station and they'll say, oh, I know what it is. And we say, uh-uh, you have to go all the way back to the top and work your way down. And they'll say, oh, I know it's this. And I'm like, wait a second, you just skipped five steps. How did you get a blue shark? Like <laughs> you, you have a flat head. So um, it's a really good process of trying to get them to go step by step. We're not that they always appreciate the encouragement, but for the most part, it goes smoothly. With looking at the three different tail shapes, uh, this one has been fairly interesting too, because with a lunate tail, it's pretty easy to say, you know, the top and the bottom have to be the exact same size and length. Um, the elongated fin, we really have to push the students to be like, okay, the top lobe is 10 times as long as the bottom lobe, because they always get very excited if they've never seen a shark before, or just see pictures, they think, yeah, of course it's elongated. They don't go all the way down. And yes, FWC uses those terms of a normal caudal fin. So <laughs> that's our key. So this is your one shot to look at it. And then we're going to go into our species one. So either you're going to be flipping through your worksheet and walking through and looking at it. Um, you may know what the shark is, but please try to play along.
and use the key. If it will uh, not pull up. I clicked too many times, Janine. I know. I don't know. It didn't do it for you. We haven't learned how to avoid this part <laughs> with dual. All right. So, oh, okay, that works too. So this is your species one. And this is the one that we did have a real model of. So our preserved specimens are casualties from our sharking excursions. So they're ones that did not survive in the nets. And that's kind of a great um, talking point with the students just to show, you know, even if there were casualties from research, they are still being used for educational purposes. So their death was not for nothing. And with that preserved shark, we actually switched over to this replica because of FIMSI, because we were trying to figure out like, how do we drive a frozen <laughs> shark across the state, make sure we have a freezer in our hotel room. Seemed like a lot of steps. We're like, okay, we need to get a good replica shark. Um, but having that preserved shark gives the kids such a great hands-on opportunity where, you know, it's kind of got that fishy smells, it's thawing out, there might be a little blood, it feels rough, they get to touch those dermal denticles, um, and it just totally blows the kids' minds. So we actually have not started using this replica in the classroom yet, um, but there are benefits too, because how um, sustainable is it to thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze a particular shark? All right, so if you could put in the chat which shark you think this is, that would be awesome. And this one we did do to scale, so it is the size of a neonate for the species, so a, um, a newborn. Nobody wanted to put their answers in the chat? Any guesses? Um, do you want to maybe walk through the, you could use the dichotomous key on your, on your own, um, you could announce it? Oh, here we go, we have some guesses, okay. I wasn't sure if people are able to use both the same. Yeah. So far it's looking unanimous bull shark. <laughs> so yeah, this is the bull shark and it's probably one of the more famous sharks because they do have that freshwater tolerance and this is the one that we, it's really drastic that we have such a high abundance in um, Faculty Union in the wet season because they're not deterred by all that extra fresh water. And it's actually in some of our research has shown along with moat that there, those juveniles are actually seeking out fresh water to um, avoid larger shark predators. So it's always kind of fun, depending on the kids' questions, we can throw in um, little tidbits and different uh, research bits as they're curious. Our frozen model does actually have some uh, stitches on its stomach because <laughs> It uh, is being used to practice surgery on sharks when we're putting acoustic tags in. So the questions you get from kids about the stitches on the stomach are hilarious. Yeah. A lot of them are like, it's pregnant. It was a mom. It gave birth. And I'm like, what size is this shark? So uh, that's always kind of fun to see. All right, we'll do species two. And hopefully this one is a little bit more. Oh, did it work? Uh, huh. I didn't like it. It was that mystery square that appeared, Janine. So this is, oh, and I forgot, the salinity tolerance for the bull shark is Ooh, yeah. 40. So write that one down. Um, this is your species two. So again, try looking at your key and work your way through it. And we do have a preserved specimen for this one, but as Janine mentioned, sometimes the key characteristics do uh, <laughs> fade out as it's been. Ah, salinity tolerance for the bull shark was zero to to 40. Whenever you think you got this, if you want to throw a guest in, then I can kind of know. <laughs> you don't look at other people's answers because that's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Could you be more specific with your answer? <laughs> but that's actually a good um, point. Some of our preserved specimens, they nice are, 
in, um, they are part of a collection of fishes for our fisheries biologists. So they do have their nice little tags about where they were caught and their scientific and common name in there. So every once in a while we get a student that figured out there's a tag in there and they'll just look at it and we're like, wait, you gotta make sure our researcher tagged it right, like go through your key. So this is the Atlantic sharp nose. And this is a smaller, well, one of the two smaller species of shark we get in the area. And it was not on, it's not in our list of our eight common species of shark we get in our trawls. We get bull, black tip, um, bonnet head, lemon, nurse, great, hammerhead, scalloped hammerhead. Am I forgetting one, Janine? Uh, sorry, what was that? I feel like I'm forgetting one. Maybe this Atlantic sharp nose and we just threw it in there. Bonnet, you said bonnet head. Bull, black tip, lemon, nurse. Well, we have, yeah, um, nurse. We'll oh, uh, black nose. Don't we have a black nose? That one was a fluke. Okay. Um, but for this shark, we have gotten two samples in our sampling and they were kind of flukes because these sharks are only around three feet when they're adults and so the two we caught were um, neonates they're very very small and they actually got caught in the middle of the hook with the bait so they would not be able to get caught in the gill net like the larger sharks so there could be more of them in the area it's just our gear type for sampling we don't get that many and this drawing is really important for this one because you can't see those white spots on our preserved specimen. So this really helps the students out. And its salinity range is going to be 20 to 40 parts per thousand. And this is the Atlantic sharp nose. Come on. It does not want to switch. Oh. Gonna do that for every slide. That's crazy. Just annoying. And your species three. This is your last one. And we, yep. And we usually get through it. We put out four sharks for the students to work their way through, but as there are other rotations during the field trips, you, and depending on how long it takes students to get through it, you may not have time to get through all four of them, and we do want to make sure they hit that um, salinity station. So the fourth one is kind of a bonus, which is why we just have the three today. And looks like you know your hammerheads. <laughs> so this is the bonnet head. It is the smallest hammerhead in the area. And this one, again, maybe only around four feet. And these are the ones that are um, preserved jars are, uh, they're kind of bent, both of our, we have a scalloped and a hammerhead. And if anybody knows if you can, or has tried to stretch out a preserved shark after it's been in one position, please let us know at the end because we want to try that. Because <laughs> yeah. the way how they're curved right now, you can't see that second dorsal fin. And so, or, so the kids either guess it only has one, or they're the same size. So that does kind of um, hold up the kids a little bit. And also when they see that flat head, they think it's a stingray. Uh, so that is kind of a good discussion point with them as well. So this guy's salinity range is gonna be 15 to 40. So it does like that slightly fresher. And fun facts about this one, I believe, um, are that they can actually chew their food and they um, eat seagrass. So it's actually an omnivore, which is great to bring up with kids because, you know, from kindergarten, you're told that sharks are predators. But wait, there's one that's an omnivore. So kind of exciting, all the new research that's going on. And all the sharks that we use in this rotation or during this lab, we try to keep them to scale. So we want to make sure that they're those smaller sizes to keep the kids thinking that our estuaries are nurseries. And so we see a lot of the young sharks. All right, Janine, all yours. Okay. Oh, you too. So, um, once they've collected all of their data, um, rotated through as many uh, specimen as possible, um, you know, sometimes a, a group doesn't even make it to the salinity station because they went through all the sharks and they just didn't make it. We run out of time because we want to make time, five minutes at least, to collect um, uh, everybody's data on one sheet. 
um, and to, to see what happened with it. So this is how we uh, will come together at the end. Um, and basically, uh, I'll write up the three bays. Um, we'll get a recording for the salinity um, from those who were at the salinity station. We'll ask all the groups to just try to shout out a member from each group, shout out what was your salinity for the dry season, you know, and it's supposed to be the same. So were they paying attention? Did they write down multiple things or just one? Um, and uh, this is again where we see those errors kind of come up. Um, so, uh, um, and we'll give them, as long as they're all in the same, like they're pretty close, we'll even go with their numbers. So like we put 35 for the um, average in the dry season for those bays, for all three bays. But like right here is an example where everybody came up with 33 that day. So we went with it because it was an unanimous. Um, so we record the dry and then we'll go over and record the wet. And again, member from each group is, oh, wet season, pumpkin bay, I got this. Oh, well, I got this. So then we talk about the errors. Well, what could have happened? Um, were, you, you know, were you using the right pipette? And they, they kind of talk it out. So you can see here, we, they recorded and they were, uh, I think, spot on in this group because we'll write down the error sometimes and then we'll, we'll make the suggested um, solution, um, parts per thousand, whatever the salinity was. So we've got 25 for Pumpkin Bay in the wet season, uh, five for FACA Union in the wet season, and then the 15 for FACA Hachi. And so hopefully what you wrote down on your piece of paper kind of lines up with this chart, hopefully, if you ID'd your sharks. Uh, so that this really nicely clearly shows that in all three bays, you get all four different species of shark. So that really shows we have this nice diversity. And then when you start looking in that white season, it starts changing. So for pumpkin, you still see all four different species. And a lot of times the kids are like, well, that's awesome. We still have more sharks. No, but wait, we got to keep going down. Back union, we just get the bull. So the kids very clearly go, oh, that's bad. It's only one species. It's a very clear, they're used to thinking of that way, that less is more. But then when you look at Thakahatchee, you have two species in that bay. You have the bull shark and the bonnet hat. So this is a great time where, depending on how much time, we usually try to give at least five minutes for this section. Um, to talk about some of those bigger questions. What's the difference between diversity and abundance? Is it a good thing that Pumpkin Bay has four different species of shark all year round? Or maybe that's changing up the other dynamics. It really helps tie in that if there's something going on with the top of the food chain, that's gonna have effects farther down. So um, we've really just enjoy doing this with the kids and it really takes all those concepts and water quality isn't necessarily uh you know that exciting but as janine said sharks gets their attention um anything else Janine? no um i just i just love any activity where we can get the students together at the end to talk about um mm -hmm. their their data and just to see who went where with it and then like dita said the questions that they end up having you know about even other things that are affected. Well, what about their food? Isn't that affected if they're affected? So it's just great. It's a great conversation. But yeah, that's, um, that's, that's Sharks by Salinity. We love your questions, feedback if you have it. Awesome, yes, um, friends, if anybody wants to type a question into the chat or if, um, if you want to raise your hand and, and speak whatever you'd like, we love some questions. Okay, Jenny asks, is there a way to do this through distance learning? I live in St. Augustine, but would love to do the activity. Hmm. I mean, we've just got it. figured out, yeah, like a part of that right here. You guys were our guinea pigs. Um, I gotta say, while we were practicing this and figuring it out, um, because it's such a hands-on activity, you know, especially with the specimens, like, um, I realized that uh, I didn't really have something like this for my teachers that are, you know, going to come in and help me lead this. We do a hands-on teacher training, but what about that teacher that can't come to a training? Now I have this awesome, you know, way to do it because of FEMC. Um, so yeah, I think that we could figure out how to, how to um, modify, you know, for 
Is you'll that, reach out to um, Janine, actually, because she is also our outreach coordinator. So she would be your point of contact for setting up the outreach. Excellent. Well, does anybody have any more questions for these guys? Take a couple seconds. For recommendations on how to stretch out sharks. <laughs> All oh, right. <laughs> or if you've experienced, uh, you know, redoing your specimen collection. So ladies, Angie asks, how do I get in touch with you? Okay, I'm going to put my email. It's on the screen, but I'll type it in here if it's easier to just copy and paste. Okay. I can do the same. Oh, nice. Casey's going to help us transfer this to virtual gold. It's awesome. Yay! Excellent. All right. Virtual gold. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies, if you want to, we'll shop, stop your share. Uh, Beverly had a great question, actually. Oh, I missed it. Um, she asked if the sharks will be able to survive by swimming away from the salinity, and that's actually what makes them such a great indicator species for the restoration project because they, if we have the more like benthic, demersal fish, if there's that big salinity change, they're going to die. They don't just move away, but since sharks are strong swimmers, hopefully you'd see the numbers and like the diversity kind of getting more similar to Thakahatchee more uh, quicker because they are larger and they can swim. So hopefully they'll be uh, one of the first indicators that the restoration project has been a success versus say a blenny or a goby or <laughs> invertebrate populations. Yeah, the next five to 10 years of, should be really exciting for this area of the, this part of the reserve and for, um, for this uh, monitoring. Excellent. Any other questions, you guys? All right, well, thank you guys all so very much. Dita and Janine, thank you. That was amazing. I cannot wait to use that with my students. Um, hopefully they will be back on site pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody, just to let you all know um, that we are kind of switching over systems um, for FEMSI as far as membership. So if you guys are a current member and you would like to renew, what you're going to do is you're going to email Jenny at membership at femzy.org. Okay. Um, and if you're brand new, I actually just put a new membership link in the chat. Um, so go to that. We'd love to have you. Um, as you can see, our FEMSI is just, FEMSI is just a big family and we would love to have you um, join. Um, also, because you're, normally your membership is going to renew uh, at the conference, so those of you guys that need to re renew, just email Jenny and we'll take care of that. Um, also, guys, if you enjoyed this session um, and you want to consider donating to um, FEMSI, so our regular annual conference is a great source of our, FEM of our funding, and unfortunately we weren't not able to recover all of the costs from that um, because of um, not being able to have the in-person conference, so there is a link to our new GoFundMe page in the chat box if you want to check that out. Um, we would greatly appreciate it. So again, Dita and Janine, thank you guys so very much. That was so wonderful.